So in the second part, let's continue by talking about correlation and all of its other facets. So it's an effect size. Cool. So it's a model and an effect size, which is pretty nice. And I can use that for statistical testing because any model can be tested statistically. Okay, what should I do when it comes to data screening? Okay. So I hope you've seen that we've brought back now both the graphs chapter and now the data screening chapter and the whole model fit thing from the beginning. Okay. Well, we should always check for accuracy, missing data, which we would usually exclude pairwise, especially if we wanna calculate multiple correlations. Outliers heavily influence correlations because it, notice that in the formula, the mean is present. So anything that relies on the mean in some form is influenced by outliers. Normality, linearity, because this is a linear modeling class, okay. homogeneity, but more importantly, homoscedasticity. So that the variance is equal for, um, at every point of X, the variance of Y is approximately the same. So we're missing one and that's additivity because we have one X and one Y and additivity only matters when we have multiple X's um, to one Y. So don't need it. Okay. So we'll leave that one out when we talk about correlations. Now, I wanna switch from talking about the correlation as a model and we'll look at model fit when we talk about how we can calculate correlation other than just core. Uh, to correlation uh, being part of a statistical test. Okay. Correlation is not the statistical test. The statistical test we'll use is t-test. Okay. T-tests are also used for other purposes like testing the mean as a model. So I hope you're seeing that we build these models that we can measure their fit on. It gets a good feel like, um, do I have a good model to represent the data or do I need more data? Then we can use a statistical test to ask questions about the model. Okay. Our statistical tests that we'll use this semester are F tests and T tests, okay. but there are other ones, chi square. And then there's a whole field of Bayesian statistics that we'll just mention and let it walk away. <laughs> okay, that's a different class. Um, <clears throat> okay, and then there's also effect sizes to help us. So we have three sets of tools in our toolbox to accurately interpret these things. So much focus is placed on p-values and the null hypothesis test, it doesn't have to be that way. Okay. We can look at our correlation and the model fit of that correlation and just kind of tell if this is worth talking about or not. Because the, the co uh, confidence interval is huge, what do you actually know? Not a whole lot. Okay. I can look at the effect size and tell you how practically that may or may not be useful. Okay. Correlations are two for one because you can do both of those together. Not all statistics work that way. Um, then I could finally go in and talk about its statistical significance. Okay. So I think we place too much emphasis, um, we being academics mostly, but we place a lot of emphasis on p-values. These were significant. And when you see people do write-ups for pop culture or the news or whatever they talk about it, it was significant. And that makes it sound like it was important. Okay, but significance is easy to game. Okay. It's easy to cheat. <laughs> um, and the, the whole field is called p-hacking. It's really interesting sets of research on research, right? Uh, studying how people do this even unintentionally. Um, and so I wanna give you the whole, the whole toolkit. You need more than just the hammer. <laughs> You also need a screwdriver and a set of pliers for this ridiculous example. So briefly, let's go back and focus on the statistical test though. And often you'll see people describe correlation as a statistical test. I think I edited that out of these notes actually, as a correlation is not the test, it's the model, which we're gonna test with the t-test. So we were discussed the null hypothesis significance testing as a framework before many lectures ago for interpretation of a statistical test. So for correlation, the way this might go down is we could set up a null or nil hypothesis that the correlation between two variables is effectively zero. Okay. So we could say, well, if the null is true, there's no relationship between these variables. If the null is not true, our alternative 
is that there is a relationship between these variables and the correlation is not to zero. Okay, that's not bad. This is the traditional setup. This is the assumption that of the setup given the default options in most um, statistics programs okay. is that you're using this kind of idea. Now, it doesn't have to be that way. We could use a different form of this setup in a one-tailed test. We say, you know what, the correlation between the exam performances, uh, exam performance and revisions is less than 0.1. Okay. And that means that the alternative hypothesis has to be the opposite of that, which means that it's greater than 0.1. And so in this scenario, what we're only interested in seeing is if that correlation is bigger than small. Okay. So this is a way to test it against maybe an effect size that we're interested in. So I only care if that correlation is bigger than a small one, because okay. I would like to reject the null that that correlation is negative or less than 1, 0.1. Okay. And by rejecting the null, I would support my hypothesis that the correlation is bigger than 1. Okay. So don't forget, with null hypothesis testing, what we do is we calculate the likelihood that the null, that we would get this result if the null was true. And so we never accept the null. We never accept the research hypothesis. We only reject the null based on probabilities. Okay, that's where alpha comes in. Or fail to reject the null. Those are your two options. So I either reject the null because I have gathered enough detective evidence to support that that's unlikely. So going back to our detective example, we reject the idea that nothing happened because we gathered enough evidence to say that something happened. Or I fail to reject the null. Maybe I still believe my research hypothesis is true, but I didn't get enough evidence to support me doing anything, like arresting anyone, <laughs> okay? And so we are gathering our model here to see if the model presents us with enough evidence to reject the null. Okay. And um, we're going to do that with p-values. But one note before we go there is that when you're building these null hypothesis tests, assumed or not, because many people assume this, this first setup, this is zero versus not zero. Okay, it's the most popular way to do this. You've got to make sure that these two hypotheses are opposites of each other and it covers the entire range of possibilities. So here's an example we can't use. Okay. The correlation between exam performance and exam revisions is zero and the correlation of exam performance and revisions is greater than 0.1. Okay. Because what happens if it's negative? I don't have, I don't have a solution for that, <laughs> right? I have, it's zero or not, and then it's greater than 0.1. So you have to make sure that whatever hypothesis test that you set up, implied or not, does not um, exclude some possibilities because they could happen. So in this case, with a negative correlation, we would have no way to test that evidence. Okay. Now, um, what we would do to calculate is um, we could use core, which we've been doing for data screening and we used earlier in the example for this lecture, okay. but that doesn't give us p-value. What does even p-value even tell me anyway, <laughs> right? So for our um, purposes, we could calculate the correlation, but we also need to figure out how to calculate the model fit for our confidence intervals. Oh yeah, FYI, there are other types of correlations that we could calculate. And maybe I also want to do the statistical test. Okay. So to get all of those, we kind of have to commandeer a couple of different packages and we'll talk about how to calculate them. But first let's talk about this p-value thing. Okay. So what we do when we set up our correlation as a statistical test is statistics people love to standardize stuff, right? That's our thing, right? I speak from experience. We can like, but Dr. B, correlations already standardized and you know, yep, that's great, but that's not a statistical test. T is our statistical test for correlation. So what we do is we use correlation as our model and then we divide that by a form of error. 
all statistical tests, this is the second equation. Okay. We have our equation for our model and then our equation for our statistical test to tell us something about that model. All statistical tests are some form of model over error. Um, there's a really great YouTube video. Uh, I think it's called stats wrap with a Z, stats wrap, stats -z with a Z wrap. And they have this really great line. It's the uh, difference on the top and the error on the bottom. <laughs> and so most statistical tests are some form of that formula. The model on the top divided by the error on the bottom. And so for correlation, that's correlation on the top divided by the error. Okay. Um, but for our statistical test, it's the correlation minus the null hypothesis in this case, which is zero. So it's just correlation. Either way. So we will convert our correlation into a statistical test. I think there's a misnomer or a, a, a misunderstanding that people think that correlation is the statistical test because when we report these, like academics wise anyway, uh, we often just write R and P together. And that's what you'll see in most journals is R and then P. And you ignore the fact that, that there's a whole another value in there that you could write about. <laughs> just conveniently, we don't report it. Why don't we report it? Can you guess? It's because SPSS doesn't give it to you. So the, the long history has been to not report them. Um, I don't think that's going anywhere <laughs> personally, uh, but it does have a separate statistical test, which is T. So we convert R into a T value. Well, what do we know about T values? Well, we know that T values are part of that, that um, uh, set of, of tests that allow us to question if our null hypothesis is true or not. And so a T value represents the ratio of model to error. So if I have a T value of four, what I'm saying is the model is four times more variance accounted for, so to speak, um, to the error. Okay, or four times as likely to the error. And, but the issue with T values is they depend on the sample size. That's where degrees of freedom come in. So with every t value, the degrees of freedom, so how big your sample is, changes the distribution. Okay. Now our z distribution doesn't change. So when we looked before and we talked about what is p less than 0.05 for z, it's always 1.96, always. Okay. What is p less than 0.05 for t? Well, it depends. How many people do you have? If you have five people, it's very different than if you have 100 people. If you have 100 people, it's very close to 1.96. <laughs> so t-tests are not perfectly good at the standardization thing. Okay? They do create them all on the same distribution. Okay? And those values have a, like a known structure depending on the sample size and the degrees of freedom. So we're going to standardize it one more time to get our p-value. Okay? So the way I think about this is that um, a statistical test is a race car. And that race car always usually starts at zero because a T-score of zero is very likely. Okay. So we're gonna start, our, start at the starting line here. Now, either the correlation is negative and the T-score is negative or the correlation is positive and the T-score is positive. Okay. And our little race car has to get to a certain cutoff score, a certain line in the sand that it has to cross for us to consider it to be significant. But the problem is with T, that line shifts, it moves, okay? If you have a small sample size, it gets further away because I need the evidence to be really strong before I decide that you are significant because you didn't collect very much evidence. If you have a really large sample size, it gets closer to you. This is the central limit theorem, right? It gets more normal. Um, with a really large sample size, it gets closer to me. I don't have to work quite as hard because I worked all my hard parts at collecting the sample. So I don't have to have quite as much evidence because I have a lot of data. But again, I gotta remember whether the degrees of freedom. So P in a sense, P values, not only the probabilities that we can make some judgment call on are like sort of the ultimate standardization because it, it is consistent across tests, right? So if I tell you the P value for the T test was 0.03, the P value for the F test could also be 0.03 and we would interpret those the same way with some caveats that we'll get to in a minute. So people often focus solely on P. 
sometimes this is called stargazing because the the um many statistical programs would print little stars based on the p-value <laughs> there's a package i think called stargazer on purpose <laughs> for that but what we do is we 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 calculate this p score to make our judgment call on and that judgment call is based on type one error so type one error remember is our alpha criterion and this is the um, likelihood of rejecting the null when we shouldn't. Okay. And this really becomes for us a decision spot. Most people set this to P less than 0.05 because then what you're saying is that the likelihood of you rejecting the null when you shouldn't or saying there's a difference or saying the correlation exists when you shouldn't is we're trying to keep it at 5%. Okay. We're okay with being wrong 5% of the time. Now the likelihood of being wrong actually is usually a little bit higher than that, but that's the idea. So hopefully this kind of pulls in, why do people focus so much on P less than 0.05? Okay, there's a lot of like practical reasons for publishing and tenure and that kind of stuff, but um, it's because that's how we're making our judgment call on that statistical test. So P tells me the likelihood of getting this result, this model, if the null is true. So what's the likelihood of getting this result, the model, if the null is true? Okay. So we want that bad boy to be small. So what's the likelihood that we would get this wild result and we shouldn't have ever seen the result? Okay, so we use small probabilities. And some people think about um, these as the likelihood of the null. And I know that's not quite right. It's the likelihood of this result, if the null is true. And so we want that to be small because then we're saying this is not very likely because the null is not very likely. Reject the null. Therefore, we're going to support our research hypothesis because the null is really unlikely. It's a lot of backwards thinking. So that was a really long-winded explanation of p-values, but this is the first time we've really looked at them very much. Now, we've talked about p-values before in our data screening section, but we didn't spend just a whole lot of time of like how this actually works. So moving on. How do we calculate these? Give me the code. Okay, so we can use our basic core function and it's gonna tell us three different types of correlations. So we can use it for Pearson, Spearman, or Kendall's. Okay, and we'll get into what those are in a minute. We can do a bunch of correlations at once, which is handy, but that's where the handiness ends because there are no p-values and no confidence intervals. So let's look at how we do that. Now I've left gender as a one and a two, so we can use it in a correlation and we'll talk about what type of correlation that is in a minute. So here we've got our exam score and we've dropped the ID column that's in this data set. So this data set has like an ID, revisions, exam, anxiety, and gender. Use pairwise complete just drops missing data when um, it has that data for that correlation combination. Method equals Pearson gives me the Pearson correlation, okay, which is the norm, the one that everybody talks about. When they say correlation, they generally mean Pearson's. So we can see that the relationship between exams and revisions is 0.4. Okay. Relationship between anxiety and revisions is 0.71. It's really strong okay, and negative. You now we could change method here to Spearman or Kendall and notice that they're fairly different in some places and not others. So we'll talk about Kindle and experiment in just a minute. Another thing we can use is this cool function hmisc called rcore. Okay, the rcore function will calculate Pearson and Spearman, but no Kindle. Okay. Multiple correlations at once, cool. Includes the p-values. Oh, we're getting close. No confidence intervals. There is no one function that does them all, unfortunately, that I'm aware of at the moment. Now with R court in the HMISC library, this is the key piece here. Make sure you have this as matrix component or it won't run and you'll be unhappy. Okay, so it needs to say as matrix next to it. The thing I like about R core is it gives you these nice neat little par uh, paragraphs, uh, chunks back. So these are the correlations. 
here's the sample size. And if the sample size differs for each correlation, it will actually print you this little table again. And then here are our p-values. So what can we decide? If we set alpha to 0.05, what we would find is that revisions and exams, that correlation is 0.4, and that is significant because that's less than 0 0.05. 0 0.7, also significant, but not this 0 0.09 number. Okay, like gender is pretty much not related to anything, but revisions, exams, and anxiety are all heavily intercorrelated. Now, one warning here, when you're reporting this information, don't say P equals zero, 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 because p-values don't equal zero. They approach zero. And so you can, I feel like I'm getting old and I'm showing my age when I say this dumb and dumber quote, like you're telling me there's a chance, right? One, I haven't watched that movie in forever, but that's like the one thing I can remember from that movie and the shaggy van from the beginning. Um, but two, probabilities aren't zero. Okay. They're less than 0 0.001 in APA style, okay? But they aren't zero. So it always, I was just like cringe really hard when people put P equals zero, zero, zero. I'm like, no, nah, okay, <laughs> don't do that. Okay, one more function, core.test. Okay, core.test is magical. It calculates all three, only one at a time though, but it gives me the statistical test, the p-values, and the statistical test, the t-score, <laughs> and the confidence interval. So it's pretty close to magic. <laughs> we can write a loop and maybe make it do all of them for us. Okay. All right, so we do core.test. We do uh, x and then y and then do method equals Pearson. Okay, so we can do any Pearson, Spitterman, or Kindles. Now here's the fun part. It shows you the statistical test, which in this case is a t-test. So it's four to one for revisions and exams. This is scientific notation, but it is significant. It's less than 0.05. It shows me the confidence interval okay, and the actual correlation. Okay, so we said before, this is a medium correlation that's positive. But now I have a better feel for how well that's measured. Okay, so this correlation, this effect size actually ranges from small to large. Okay, and that's a wide range <laughs> of small to large. <laughs> so we should consider one data screening because I think there's some outliers here, but collecting more data. So we have a better feel for is the correlation actually medium or is it actually small? Because right now I have a confidence interval that tells me my model fit is somewhere between small to large. It's like, which one is it? Right. So we want to hopefully narrow that confidence interval and create a better model fit to the data of something we can be more confident in. Okay. That's not a crazy huge confidence interval, but having that effect size across all three boundaries is um, makes it kind of wide. Okay. I've seen bigger ones, but with a larger sample size, we can probably, we would see a, a decrease in that confidence interval. That's the way they work. All right. So with any statistical test or model, we have to be careful in our interpretations. So correlation has a bunch of caveats as a model. The first one is what's called the third variable problem. So in any correlation, I can't tell you the causality the direction of the prediction, because there could be some other third variable that predicts them both. And you'll see this um, in general, correlation is sort of an interesting thing because there are what's called voodoo correlations. Okay. Many things are correlated just randomly. Okay. And I expect many things to pop up with at least a small correlation. And if I run enough people, it's significant. So this is why all three parts are important, the model, the fit, and the statistical test. And then in our case, uh, an effect size, which is our model. So this is a really cool website called Spurious Correlations. Um, it's on Tyler Vengeance website that shows you that almost that things can be correlated that don't make any sense. So let's see, number of people who drown by falling in a pool um, correlates at 0.6. So a large correlation for the number of films Nick Cage has been in. 
per cheese capita consumption, the number of people who died by becoming tangled in their bed sheets. Okay. So, and that correlation is 0 0.97, 94. Um, yeah, so, you know, there are correlations that exist pretty randomly. It's not a perfect model. So we have to be careful implying that correlation means more than just a, a relationship. Okay. So often people describe this as correlation does not equal causation. Okay. It could be a third variable or we just don't know what order it goes in. So, um, you know, it could be X causes Y or it could be Y causes X. Now, to be fair, there are some things that the order is fairly obvious. For example, smoking, we're pretty sure smoking causes cancer. But in people, we can't actually do that experiment because it's not very ethical. Okay, we let them do it on their own. But consider, you know, I guess it could be that you get cancer and you're like, screw it, I might as well start smoking. But in general, we think that smoking causes the cancer because it comes first. But it is just a correlation because the, exp the, the data collection style is called correlational. Okay, so don't confuse the data collection style where you're only measuring things, which is called correlational because we shouldn't have too many cooks in the kitchen here. Correlation is the name for many things at once, unfortunately. Um, don't confuse that with the test itself. We can run correlations in an experiment as well. Okay, so correlation here is the math and not the type of measurement design. Now, I've been talking about um, this Kindle and Spearman thing. What the heck are those? Okay. Well, what we mostly calculate as correlations are Pearson's R. And Pearson's R is like the most popular. If you hear someone say correlation more than 95% of the time, that's what they're talking about. But not everything meets the assumptions <laughs> of a parametric test. So what can we do? Well, we can calculate Spearman's row, okay, which is the Pearson correlation math on the ranked data. So you take your variable and you just rank it in order. Okay, so you rank X and then you rank Y and you see how much the ranks either go up or go down together. Tau, on the other hand, is a slightly different form of Spearman's that's better with small samples and with ties. So if you have data that a lot of the points are the same, that calculates a tie. And um, Kindles handles ties better. So let's do an example. And we'll use this data to calculate a couple of different types of correlations. OK. So the data set has 68 contestants who are participating in the world's best liar competition, which if I can be afforded a small joke is politics. <laughs> so that being said, what do we measure them on? Well, we looked at where they placed in this world's best liar competition, first, second, third. Okay. And then we uh, also measured their creativity with this questionnaire, thinking that they're more creative, maybe they're better at lying. And then last, we just said, have you been doing the, have you participated in this competition before? So here's the structure of the data frame. Okay. And notice here that this is a character. And I did this on purpose, but normally you're like, but Dr. B, during data screening, you said, make these factors. And you know what? You're right. <laughs> make them factors. But I also want to show you what happens if you forget. Okay, so we're going to look at that in a minute. Thanks for listening. So let's look at that example. This data set has truly ordinal data, which we haven't worked much with because there are ranks first, second, third, fourth. Okay. So a non-parametric test is more appropriate. Okay. So let's look at Spearman here. Now, the bad thing is uh, that uh, confidence interval thing only works on Pearson's, but we can still calculate. So let's look at Spearman's row here and we get um, a row of 0.37 between creativity and position. So creativity is our creativity score. So we would expect that the higher the creativity, the um, lower the position because you're more likely to win and that would be first rather than last. Okay. 
Now, so that makes it negative. And we've got 0.3, so it's medium correlation. Okay, the interpretation is the same. But I want to circle, I want to go back to a point I made a minute ago that statistics is a great standardization. So one reason why we don't just use T for everything and make decisions based on T is I would have no idea how to compare that to this test because I would have to have a completely different set of rules because it's S, okay? So it's a different type of statistical test because this is not um, normal. T is a normal distribution test. Okay. But P, I can interpret this P just like I interpreted the P values for a T test. Okay. I would say, well, that's less than 0.05. So that's why we really like P because you don't have to remember what the rules are for every degree of freedom and every statistical distribution. We just convert them to the most standardized option, which is the probability. Now, here's the thing I also wanna compare this to that I see students do. So don't write P equals zero for me. But the other thing you shouldn't do is compare P values against each other. And it's very tempting. I see people do this and I cringe and then I write them mean notes where let's compare same data, same thing. We're gonna calculate Kindles. Notice that rho is 0.37, tau is 0.3. They're both in the same range of effect size, but they're slightly different. But their p values are also different okay, because they're different statistical tests. This one's a z. Now it's very tempting to say that Kendall's is more significant because the p value is smaller. Don't do that. We'll excommunicate you. Absolutely not. Bad dog. Because p-values, while standardized, are good for comparing against alpha, a criterion. They're not good for comparing against each other. Okay. A lower p-value just tells me that we had a larger model to area error. <laughs> I'm so passionate, I got upset. Um, a larger model to error ratio in that statistical test, in that setup, okay, than maybe another one did. It does not tell me anything that this is more important because P is lower. Okay. That's where effect sizes come in. And practically the effect size for this one with a lower P value is smaller than the first one. Okay. So do not compare P's directly like that. Okay. You can just say it's significant or it's not significant. If you wanna compare size differences there are a lot of jokes here, none of them appropriate for class, but if you want to compare size differences, look at the effect size, okay, not the p-values. There are too many jokes here for class, so we're going to move on. <laughs> so I would get in trouble. Um, so let's look here at one more kind of piece to this puzzle where that correlations have to work on numeric values, but a minute ago I did it on gender. So what am I actually doing with, with that? Now, if I have a variable that has a label, I can convert it back to a number by using it as numeric. Okay. But only in this scenario, or I can only do binary predictors this way. Okay. You can't work with more than three because then you need to switch to something like an ANOVA or some other test. Um, you should stick to uh, just binary ones. And so when I do a correlation with a binary variable, I'm essentially standardizing the, the difference between the group means. There are better ways to do this. This is more of a FYI because t-tests are much better here and Cohen's t. And you'll see why in a minute because we'll struggle to interpret what is going on. So t-tests on, on the difference between the means gives you the exact same answer because it's the same math, <laughs> just slightly different form, and uh, are way more interpretable than a correlation with a binary variable. But some people are just really enamored with making all of their effect sizes the same. So let's look at how this works. Okay. So I can calculate a point or a point by serial correlation with a binary variable. This is totally pedantic, but the difference between the two is that a point by serial correlation is a true dichotomy. And a by serial correlation is a um, not quite discrete, but we've split it anyway kind of dichotomy like pass fail. 
Now, practically everybody calls these point by serials. I don't think anybody's ever like truly sat down and said, nope, just buy cereal. <laughs> but FYI, they're slightly different things. Now, back to converting from characters. So if your data is in a character format, you can't put as numeric on top of that because it will just wipe it out. Okay, it'll say, I don't know what these letters mean, make them all an A. So if your data is in character format and you want to make it into a numeric format, okay, so essentially applying a number as the label, you would do as factor first to convert those characters to a factor and then as numeric. Now I saved this as a different variable just so I could remember the labels. Okay. And so what you'll see here is I have a character variable that has the like descriptive information and then our numeric variable here that's ones and twos. So let's calculate. Our enter to competition before is by serial. It's not really a discrete. They can enter it one, two, three, four, five times, right? But we characterize this as first time or not first time. And so I've calculated the correlation test. Notice I've used the with function. The with function allows us to apply a data set frame, a data frame name to everything later. So this is the same thing as doing liar dollar sign creativity or liar dollar sign novice. And you can use this in a lot of places. I'm just trying to introduce some things slowly. Okay. So let's see, the correlation is 0.26. Very, it's close to medium here. Okay, the confidence interval here is pretty wide. This is like almost zero to almost large. So we're not measuring this very well. We don't have a whole lot of data. The t-test um, gives us a two to one ratio and our p-value is 0.03, which is less than 0.05. And so I think we can kind of see that the effect size here is kind of smaller and um, that's the model fits not great either, okay, but it is significant. Now, what does that correlation mean? When it's, when it's a categorical variable like this. I don't know, maybe I can make a plot and make this easier to understand. No, <laughs> okay. So what we've got here is our creativity score along the bottom and our liar score, our liar score is either a one or a two. Okay. And so this negative correlation occurs because the two category has a slightly lower creativity score than the one category. So what we're really saying here is if you've entered the competition before you have a slightly, wait, okay. Uh, if this is your first time to enter the competition, your score is slightly higher than if you've entered it before. And a t-test is so much better for this because you would calculate the means and compare them directly. So we can do this with correlation. We would get the same t-values and so everything here. Okay. Um, but it's not very easy to interpret. So I'd tell you, I'd recommend you lean away from it if you can. Now, two last components here, and these are sort of tack add-on pieces that are important for um, statistical questions and um, for next week. So I would say out of the things that people send me an email and ask me about, for a long time, this was one of the most popular ones. Um, and then mediation and moderation, which we'll do in a couple of weeks. Okay. And so the question often is like, how do I compare? <coughs> excuse me, it's, it's how do I not hack in class? Okay, so how can I tell if these two correlation coefficients are different from each other? So I have one for group one and one for group two, are they different? Right, did my intervention work or whatever? And so I love this because the package name is CoCore. Sounds like I'm saying CoCore, but I'm not. I'm saying CoCore. Okay. So with my accent, or I just think the combination of phonemes there, this sounds hilarious. And wait, the next package will too. <laughs> so there's your good laugh at the end of this lecture. <laughs> Don't be surprised if this is a pretest question. Um, but we can use the comparing correlations package to help us answer this question. 
first thing you have to do is decide if the correlations are independent or dependent. Independent correlations are correlations that come from two separate groups of people. So that makes it pretty easy. You have some sort of categorical variable to split on. Okay. Dependent correlations are from the same people, but slightly different variables. So let's look at that in practicality here. So there is no split function in CoCore. Okay. You just kind of have to re you know, like restructure the, the way the data is saved in R to get this to work. So what you do is you take the data set, you split it in half, then you stick it back together again, okay. but as a list. So if you give the CoCore package a list of data frames, it goes, ooh, independent. If you give it one data frame, it goes, ah, dependent. Okay. So we will subset our data, slap them back together in a list, and feed that through our function. And the way that we write these functions is tilde, okay, it's co-core as the function, tilde x plus y, pipe x plus y, data equals data set. So we'll fill in x plus y as our correlation, and yes, you'll repeat it because you want to compare. What you're doing is the one before the pipe is the first data set, and the one after the pipe is the second data set. So you're comparing the same correlation in both data sets. I don't know why. Someone somewhere knows why, but I don't, I don't know, have a good scenario for why for group one, you'd compare this correlation to a completely different correlation for group two. I'm sure someone has a reason. And you can do that in this, but in general, they're the same. Okay. So to do that, we'll load the library. We'll use that subset function. Okay. And we're going to subset on our liar data set by um, grabbing our first times, novices. Our old folks are people who've entered the competition before. And then this is the slapping it back together. So we create an independent data where it's the, um, y'all just hit me out of nowhere. It's the, um, a list of the new and old, uh, data sets together. I'm gonna sneak out, I have a sneaky Coke over here. All right. So we've created our data set, our list. And so we're going to run this creativity plus position, pipe creativity plus position okay, on our independent data. It will show you each of those. So we're going to compare 0 0.21 to 0 0.38. Okay, so there appears to be a stronger correlation for our older group, our group that's done this before, than our new group. Okay and then calculates, it actually gives you a ton of information here, but it basically says that the null hypothesis is that they're equal, so the difference between them is zero. And the alternative hypothesis is that they're not equal, so the difference between them is not zero. And we're gonna use 0.05 as our alpha. So I like this package because it, it tells you here, null hypothesis retained. Okay, these do not appear to be significantly different because P is greater than 0.05. Double plus, it gives you the confidence interval of the difference. Okay. So this is the confidence interval of one minus two, basically. Okay. So it's likely that they are a medium effect size negative different all the way up to a large effect size positive different. And that covers like nearly every possibility. So we don't have a good feel at all right now for if they are different. Let's do that same thing for dependent correlations. And what we just do is uh, our co-core function um, where in this case, we're saying is the correlation between X and Y bigger or is Y and Z bigger? Basically, that's the idea. Um, and these are overlapping correlations. And this is really useful if you're trying to find um, which variable works better. You could also do non-overlapping correlations. And I've never had to do these. You practically, you can, but I've never really figured out a good scenario when I want to know which correlation is bigger between these non-overlapping variables. But you can do it. Okay. And the data frame is one data frame, not in list format, just fed into the function. 
And notice here that it says the results of two overlapping correlations based on dependent groups. So here we're asking, is there a difference between revising and exams and revising and anxiety? And this is not really a fair comparison because one of them is positive and medium and one of them is large and negative, but <laughs> it will show you what significant one looks like. So there's a lot of output here. It, they give you like every test possible. I will tell you that most people still use this Pearson one. And we would say that the null hypothesis is rejected. P is less than 0.05. Those are different correlations. And then we can also still get the confidence interval here, but it's the confidence interval of the difference. So it looks a little crazy, but the, the difference here is quite large is what this is saying. All right, so that's how we can compare correlations. One last piece. And these are really more useful for next week, but I wanna introduce them now. And that's part and partials. So if you've ever used some uh, SPSS, these are called part and partials, right? where part is semi-partial and partial is partial, because <laughs> that's not confusing at all. But what the heck are these? Well, partial correlations is the, the solution to that third variable problem. Okay, and it's not perfect, but it's a good, good test, where we're gonna measure the relationship between two different variables while controlling for the effect of a third variable on both of them. So you have these three variables, you have two variables you're interested in and you just yoink out the third one. Or I guess you yeet it out if I can use pop culture. Okay, so in two years that joke won't make any sense. But you take out the variance due to that third variable and then look at the, the relationship between the two of them. So you can't say, well, it's actually because of X. You're like, well, I took that bad boy out. So these are very popular. Their interpretation is pretty nice. A semi-partial correlation, I would uh, yoink these right out the window. I don't like semi-partials, <laughs> you'll see why. <laughs> okay. um, it measures the relationship between two variables controlling for the effect the third one has on only one of them. Okay. In a correlation scenario, this makes literal no sense. The first one, the partial correlation is remove Z variable, the third variable from both X and Y, and then see what happens with X and Y. A semi-partial correlation is remove Z variable okay, from just Y, not X. You're like, why? Oh, 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 okay, you want it the other way? Sure, remove Z variable from X and not Y. See what happens. So I'm positive somewhere someone knows why semi-partials are great, but I don't know them. Okay, what is it? I, I don't know this. I'm sorry to this man, if I can get some Kiki Palmer in here. So I've had enough, enough pop culture references for this video. Semi-partial correlations are very confusing. They're hard to interpret in this correlation standpoint. When we talk about them in regression, they make a little bit more sense because you always control on why the criterion variable. That makes a little bit of sense, but I will tell you that I don't like semi-partials and I don't think you should use them okay? because they're so difficult to interpret. Someone can tell me I'm wrong, but at the moment, no one is telling me I'm wrong. Okay. So let's think about this as like comes from cute Venn diagrams. Okay. So here's the overlap between two variables. Here's our coefficient of determination, right? This would be R squared, just multiplied by 100. The overlap between exam performance and anxiety. And then there's an overlap between exam performance and revisions. So we could throw these all together. This would be our big R squared, how much they overlap all three of them. And what I could do is remove this variance that overlaps. Okay, so we would remove the variance um, due to revisions and then look at exam anxiety and performance or remove the variance due to performance and look at revisions and anxiety. But for semi-partials, we only remove it from one side or the other, not both. So let's look at how you do this. This is my other funny package. It's PP core and I laugh every time, I can't help it. Um, the way it works is very similar to the core function. So we're gonna drop column one, which is our ID variable and just say, give us Pearson's. 
And so what this does, the top half and the bottom half are the same. This is partials. It also gives us the p-value and the t-score. So that's nice. Um, so notice that the top and the bottom are the same. And so this is the correlation between revisions and exams controlling for anxiety and gender because we left both of them in there. Okay. And you'll notice that this correlation has gone away. It's no longer significant if I can do um, scientific notation here. And that was 0.4. Okay, so once we remove anxiety and gender out of this equation, we see that this is no, that very relationship is no longer there. Now you see the same thing for anxiety and exams. Once you remove revisions, that relationship's not there. But revisions and exams, still strong. This was 0.7, so it didn't really change. So I can see that there's some substantial overlap between some of these. And that's a really handy thing to know because now I know that those correlations of them both being 0.4, okay, these exams and revisions and exams and anxiety was because the, all three of them overlap pretty well. Okay, they're not distinct separate things. All right, now my least favorite slide, semi-partial correlations. Okay, the function for that's very easy. It's SP core, but the interpretation is, is the crappy part. So, the way that you can interpret these is um, essentially by thinking about the top bar here. Okay, so this is the correlation for exams and revisions, removing everything from revisions. Okay. This is the correlation for exams and revisions, removing everything from exams. Okay. So notice they are not the same. Okay. And I find that very difficult to interpret because correlations should be <laughs> like somewhat steady. Like why would I only remove anxiety on exams and gender on exams and not out of the revisions component? Okay. I just don't have a good answer for that question. So, and, but the fact that they're different in different directions is confusing. So that's why I always recommend partial correlations because I've taken it out of both of them. Okay, so I'm just taking it out completely. But in this case, it's revisions and exams, removing everything from this column and exams and revisions, removing everything from this column. So it only is affected on exams or only on revisions. Um, and now I can see, but with revisions and anxiety, removing everything from anxiety, that's 0. 0.6. And revisions and anxiety, removing everything from revisions is also 0. 0.6. So that implies that the inter, the, that is not correlated with hardly anything else. Um, but in general, I'm not, I'm not gonna recommend these, but we are gonna talk about them next week in a scenario that makes a little bit more sense. So this is kind of a preview um, of how complicated correlation really is. All right, so let's summarize everything we've done. Okay. And man, you're like, everybody knows correlations. Those are easy, right? Well, what have we learned? There are way more correlations than just Pearson. So there's Pearson's, right, the spindle, spindles, <laughs> Spearman's, Kindles, there's this point by serial thing I never knew about. There's these semi partial correlations, and then there's these partial correlations. Those are still Pearson's, but there's way more to correlation than just R. Okay. We can compare correlations to each other. We can treat correlation as a statistic, as, a, as our, our model, and we could then work on comparing models to each other. We can somewhat control for our third variable problem using partial and semi partials. There's still maybe some other fourth, fifth, sixth variable, but we can try. And correlation is so cool. It's more than an effect size. So it is a model, an effect size, and then we can then use that and test it. So the, the cool thing to me about correlations, um, other than their sort of easy interpretability, is that it's our model and our effect size. Whereas when we move into other statistics, we'll have model, model fit, a separate effect size and statistical significance. But do know that that is the entire range of tools that you can use. So we don't have to rely just on p-values to tell us something interesting, right? The model can tell us something interesting. The, the practical significance, the effect size can tell us something interesting. Model fit is very interesting. And then there's also p-values. Okay. So I'm trying to move, we're trying to move away from our over-reliance on them. They aren't going anywhere, so you have to know what they mean, but they're not the only thing that's interesting. All right, so that all together, correlation.
Next up, regression. So we'll make correlation more complicated by adding more variables to our model. 